Black Talk with James Canning. The podcast with the inside scoop on journalists from San Diego and across the nation. If you're a communications pro, have a nose for news, or you're just nosy, this is the podcast for you. Now here's your host, James Canning. Hey everybody, welcome back to Flack Talk. It's your host, James Canning. I'm really looking forward to today's show. Uh, we have somebody who's a must listen when you come to San Diego. Frankly, uh, any reporter that is the Metro reporter, someone who cares about all the issues, is covering all the issues that most citizens want to know. Talk us about your roads, your transportation, your housing. And so with us today is uh, Andrew Bowen. He's the KPBS Metro reporter and the host of the Freeway Exit podcast. Uh, Andrew, thanks for coming on. Hey, James. Thanks for having me. No, I really appreciate it. Thank you for making the time. It's always good when journalists, real journalists, want to come on and uh, chit chat and share with our audience a little bit more about them. You know, when I got here, Andrew, I don't think I've ever shared this with you, but when I got here, like I was really searching for like, who do you pay attention to? What's, what's the news that you listen to? What matters? And in my field, uh, working for the county and doing communications, you know, the person that cares about the issues that are about the regular folks uh, is what matters. And you were one of the people that I was listening to early on when I got here, even before I got a job. Um, and I think that, you know, you are somebody that people come in and they listen to all the things that you talk about because you're dealing with their everyday lives. I mean, the, the subjects that you care about and cover. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've been I've been in San Diego for uh, it'll be eight years in September, and uh, it's been really gratifying to um, get to know the community and to let the community get to know me a little bit more and um, just uh, become one of those folks who people turn to to help understand what's going on. Uh, it was. Uh, like a very fast entry into this world. I moved to San Diego, um, never having lived here before, or even been here before. Um, so uh, KPBS uh, took something of a chance on me, um, you know, being a, a total newbie to this region. But um, it's been a, a really great um, opportunity to get to know this community and to help understand what makes it tick. No, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. We share that. You know, I, when I was here, people, I was a newbie. The county took a chance on me, and I think it worked out for them and me. But uh, that's that's something. This is a very welcoming community in that way. I found that to be after traveling to a couple different places and working. Yeah, and also a lot of support amongst the journalists in San Diego. Uh, I was on the board of the Society of Professional Journalists, San Diego chapter, uh, for four years and was always really encouraged by the support that I got from my colleagues uh, outside of KPBS and uh, just the different events that they put on and um, the networking and the um, just collegial attitude. Journalism can be sometimes competitive, but I've always found that uh, uh, in San Diego, we support each other, we highlight each other's good work. And, uh, you know, we really understand that we're all working towards uh, the same goal, which is just an open, transparent uh, society with, you know, elected leaders who are accountable to their constituents and who, uh, you know, follow through on the promises that they make. Yeah. No, that's all that we, we should be asking for from our journalists. And I think that, that, you know, the professional organizations that support journalism and PR are really important to kind of uplifting uh, the careers of the folks in those areas, but then also just uh, upholding the duties, if we will. And uh, I, I appreciate the fact that you've done that. I've had to do that in my career as well, you know, get involved with those organizations. And they're great. They're great. Uh, they help you advance. I, I want to, um, we're going to get into some KPBS stuff and so forth uh, as we get into this, but I wanted to kind of take people back. I appreciate you talking about how you were, you kind of came here eight years ago, but um you know, as we talked about, you know, most people know transportation, housing, you know, bicyclists and pedestrian issues. But before joining KPBS, right now, you worked at a German international public broadcaster. I, mean, I hope I don't butcher this, but it's uh, Deutsche Welle. And then you mm -hmm. also worked at uh, Der Spiegel, which is a German's, Germany's largest news magazine. Can you tell mm -hmm. us like how you ended up getting there for after going to school? 
Sure. So um, when I was at, I went to college at Northwestern, uh, and um, I guess I could trace my interest in Germany all the way back to uh, the end of high school when I traveled with my family to Switzerland, where my grandpa did his doctorate degree in the early 50s, and um, also through Germany, where we saw some of the villages where our ancestors lived. And it was the first time that I really felt like I had any kind of cultural heritage and uh, was just very interested in the German language. So I started taking that in college, and that uh, led me to a fellowship program that I was accepted in at the end of college uh, called the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange. And uh, I was originally, the plan was to go to Germany for a year. I was going to do an internship at Deutsche Welle, uh, which, uh, as you mentioned, is the international public broadcaster of Germany, kind of like the BBC World Service uh, of Germany. And uh, so I was going to do an internship, but they had some openings for freelancers at the time. Uh, so uh, that what was originally going to be a one-year fellowship program pretty quickly turned into an open-ended job as a freelancer. And in Germany, they, uh, you know, they were really taking care of me even as a freelancer. I got uh, sick leave and and paid time off and uh, health insurance, um, wow. even though I wasn't, you know, working there full time. So it was a um, a really great uh, way to sort of get my start in uh, working there and also in Germany. Um, and uh, so I was there for all of the six years that I lived in Germany. Um, half my time I was living in Cologne and the other half I was in Berlin. Uh, and then uh, Der Spiegel, which is, uh, as you mentioned, the, the largest news magazine in Germany, had uh, still has an, uh, an English language website where they have translations of some of their German articles and also some original reporting. So I worked for them for a period of time while I was in Germany. Um, and yeah, it was really the time of my life. I got uh, to do a lot of really interesting stories. Um, I, just, I think it's a, a really um, unique and valuable experience living as a foreigner in another country, uh, especially in a country that speaks a different language. There's a certain challenge to everyday activities that um, always made me feel like at the end of the day, I, I had really accomplished something. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the quality of life that I had there just um, was really fantastic. Very livable cities, uh, very walkable cities, and um, just a, a much, uh, I think, healthier uh, relationship with work. And, uh, you know, Germans really value a healthy work-life balance. Um, so that being where I started my career, also at a time when, you know, the Great Recession was just starting when I moved there. I was able to ride that out on, uh, you know, in another country with a, um, a very, uh, you know, um, a, a, just a, a great job um, that uh, was uh, started my career. So I, I really feel fortunate for that time that I spent there and um, really treasure it. I, I, I still consider it kind of a, a second home for myself. I still have a lot of friends there and was able to go back and visit last summer. So it was a really formative time. That's awesome. I mean, that, that, that international experience, I mean, when you got into journalism, like, did you expect that you were going to have that experience? I mean, I know it sounds like it's a bit of a passion, you know, to, to uh, or was a passion to, you know, report there. Um, but like, did you, did you ever think that when you got into journalism? Like, hey, I'm going to go internationally and work. Like, what, was that even, did it even cross your mind? Yeah, you know, it, it actually was like something that I had always been drawn to uh, working and living abroad. Uh, I, I um, had different ideas of where I wanted to go uh, at different points in time, but um, I think the opportunity to go to Germany uh, was um, something that especially attracted me because, like I said, I, um, I, had, uh, I do have German roots. It's not something that I ever really um, thought about or, or anything uh, growing up. But um, it, it was a country that I actually felt I had some connection to. Yeah. And um, and uh, my grandfather um, grew up in a German speaking farming community in Iowa. Hmm. Uh, he actually stopped speaking German during World War Two wow. um, because he, you know, he and his his 
community were sort of afraid of, of being seen as un-American. Right, um, right. So wow. he, uh, German was his first language, um, but he stopped speaking it in childhood and, um, and uh, ultimately forgot it all until he moved back uh, to Switzerland to do his uh, doctoral degree in aeronautical engineering. Um, so it's just like a really interesting family history that, that kind of, uh, I felt like, I was able to sort of continue this tradition or this, this connection to this, um, other country. No, that's wonderful. A lot of people don't get that opportunity. I mean, that's fantastic. Did now did the German for you, did, did, were you learning it before you went, uh, to work for these outlets or did you kind of learn on the job or did eventually, <laughs> yeah, was so, it spoken at home or how did that work? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the only German that I ever heard at home was when my grandparents would, um, say it, the common table prayer in German before we would eat sometimes. Okay. Uh, it wasn't something that I ever heard really growing up, uh, except for a few words here and there that, um, that they would throw around, um, just kind of to be silly. But, um, the, uh, the, um, I, I started learning German my sophomore year in college. Um, and after that year, I studied abroad in Germany for seven weeks, and it was a very sort of intensive, immersive uh, lang language experience. Um, and uh, so I really kind of tried to stick with it in college. Um, and, uh, and, you know, when, when you move to a country um, and, and you're hearing it every day and speaking it every day, it obviously, um, you know, it's a much faster way to learn than if yeah. you're... Um, than if you're doing, you know, Rosetta Stone or Duolingo or anything like that. So, um, yeah, it was um, something that I uh, started in college and um, sort of uh, stuck with and um, was, uh, I mean, I, I, I've always been a fan of foreign languages uh, and I, I think it's a really great way to get to know a culture. Um, you know, there's this meme on the internet, like, what's the German word for blah, 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 you know, like a <laughs> yeah, really, really convoluted and complicated subject yeah. um, that for some reason is like one word with, you know, 36 letters. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a really interesting window into a culture and a society and, and a different, you know, way that people think and, and talk. And um, so, yeah, I, I've always um, been excited and interested in languages and, um, German has been a, just a really fascinating um, and exciting uh, passion of mine. No, that's awesome. I don't get to speak it all that often anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but uh, when I was back there last summer, uh, it was nice to kind of dust off uh, the old German and, and uh, you know, reactivate that part of my brain. Yeah, no, that's cool. And when you said passion, I mean, I think that's really important in careers like yours, you know, where you can marry a passion with you know, the work that you do every day, because it kind of makes it a little easier. Um, you know, I, I wonder too, like, I thought I read somewhere that uh, Spanish and Portuguese, you also speak these languages. Mm -hmm. So four yeah. languages, four languages, folks. Yeah. Yeah, I, I started Spanish in high school. And that uh, was actually my minor in college. Wow. Um, it was, I think, the most logical language, uh, mm -hmm. foreign language for me to learn as somebody growing up in California. I grew up in Northern California. Right. Um, and so, yeah, that um, has, you know, I've spoken Spanish longer than uh, any other language besides English. Um, Portuguese, I picked up, and it's actually funny, when I first got to Germany, I was really nervous about, um, I had just studied abroad in Argentina mm -hmm. uh, for five months, and, and um, my fluency was probably the best it had ever been at that point. And I was really nervous about um, losing and forgetting it all, um, living in Germany and being around German all the time. Yeah, um, it's always been sort of a, a struggle in my own brain for which language is more uh, dominant. I, in college, I would have um, my Spanish class immediately after my German class, so I had about ten minutes from the walk from one building to another to sort of transition my brain and and start thinking in a different language and. Um, not infrequently, I would, um, you know, uh, my Spanish teacher would ask me a question, I would respond in German, yeah. <laughs> um, which is something I think a lot of people, uh, you know, who learn uh, languages have experienced that it's like, you're not even thinking about the language that you're, you're responding in, right? Um, right. it just kind of comes out um, uh, naturally or, or involuntarily. Um, but yeah, so when I moved to Germany, I, I intentionally made a lot of uh, Spanish speaking friends 
Spaniards and Latin Americans and uh, tried to maintain those, tr worked really hard to maintain those friendships and, and relationships throughout my time there. So, um, so I actually, um, uh, ironically, spoke a lot more Spanish when I lived in Germany than I've ever spoken here in San Diego. I think partly because, um, you know, the, the Spanish speakers that I was friends with and I had something in common where we were both foreigners in this uh, country, mm -hmm. this strange country where we could sort of commiserate and and, um, <laughs> uh, and joke around about things that made, you know, that, that were different about that. Um, Portuguese was something that I picked up because, uh, again, going back to just the incredible um, uh, um, benefits that you get working in a European country, um, there was this benefit called educational holiday. Um, it's a rough translation of the German. Okay. Um, where you uh, basically get extra paid time off to do a continuing education course that is somehow related to your job. And a lot of Germans, uh, German journalists, will uh, use that um, time to learn another language. Hmm. Um, many of them will go to Malta and, quote unquote, take English classes. <laughs> um, you know, it's a, it's a couple weeks in a, in a beautiful Mediterranean island right. country, uh, you know, where they're um, theoretically learning German, but it's also just vacation. Yeah. Um, and so uh, because I had already spoken Spanish and I was really interested in Brazil and Portuguese, I figured um, how, how much harder can it be to learn this other romance language? So um, that uh, brought me to uh, Brazil, where I did a couple um, weeks of intensive uh, Portuguese classes. Uh, I did that in 2014 and then again in 2015. And um, and so that's how I ended up speaking Portuguese. It's still probably my the language that I'm least fluent in, but it's also the one that I speak the most often um, other than English because uh, my husband is Brazilian. Oh, and, wow. OK. Uh, that was uh, something that really brought us together. And so his family was visiting recently. I was their interpreter for, you know, the times when he wasn't around. Yeah. And so um, it's it's uh, I'm still it's like a constant, you know, uh, languages are something you constantly have to maintain. Yes. And you're always learning. Um, so it's uh, it's um, definitely work, but it's also really fun and uh, just a really enriching um, part of my life. No, that's I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you for sharing those details. I think that like, I don't know, I took Spanish in like grade school all the way through college. And uh, admittedly, you know, I didn't didn't really learn a lot. And it would be very valuable right now living in California. Um, yeah. And so I think you're right. It's all about that discussion and kind of immersing yourself in it and being able to kind of keep it going. I have some coworkers that 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 whole thing about uh you may be thinking one thing, but you're, you know, you, you say it in Spanish or you say it in another language. They do that often. I've picked up a couple words that way, but, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. def definitely not enough to talk. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, reporting in Germany. You know, are there any interesting, well, I'm sure a lot of it was interesting, but, you know, bizarre or outlandish stories or maybe culture shock initially like about stories you were reporting on or you know something that happened while you were reporting that was just different uh than maybe you would have thought or heard or something that you didn't expect um yeah about being there sure i can um share one story that i worked on towards the end of my time in germany that um definitely stands out to me okay um and it's a um some listeners might be a little weirded out by it, but I think it's a, a really interesting window into Germany um, and the approach that um, just how different they are from our culture. Um, so there I was on the uh, subway in Berlin and I saw this ad on uh, the little TVs that they have there. Mm -hmm. um, I won't really describe what the ad was but it, or, you know, what happens in it, but it basically was an ad for uh, pedophiles to oh, seek wow. a treatment for their condition so okay. that they can learn how to never abuse a child. Wow. Um, and this was just like, you know, playing in public there, you know, like people, um, anybody could see this. Um, and it was, uh, so I was like, huh, this is interesting. I've never heard of this before. Um, so I looked up the organization and um, it was basically this, um, this uh, campaign to try and reach uh, people who recognize that their attraction to children is uh, not something that they can ever act on 
and um, try and, and basically equip them with the tools to be able to manage their, um, you know, this, the condition that they have and wow. um, to basically be, you know, uh, what some researchers have called the golden pedophile, which is someone who, um, uh, it, the, the research basically tells us that um, pedophilia, which is often used interchangeably with uh, a, like child molester, but it's very different. Most people who abuse children sexually are not pedophiles. Um, okay. But a pedophile is somebody who believes they could have a, a um, an actual relationship, like a romantic relationship with the child. Oh my, um, okay. So, uh, so um, this program existed basically to, and still exists, I believe, um, to uh, provide therapy for, for these um, people and I, you know, I was thinking, well, this is something I've never heard of in any country before. So I, I, you know, I'd like to do a story on it. So um, I ended up reaching somebody who had gone through this uh, therapy program and, and interviewed him. Uh, it was kind of uh, in far in the exurbs of, of Berlin. Uh, we met in a public park. He was uh, wanted to remain anonymous because he's he was really afraid of uh, you know, being, um, hunted down by people right. in his community. But this is somebody who had never, uh, once touched a child, uh, inappropriately and, um, who had managed to, uh, get to a point in his life where he felt like he could, um, still function as an adult and, and deal with this, um, uh, condition that, um, the research really tells us is not something that uh, people can necessarily change. They may have been um, born that way and, you know, have to learn how to control their, um, their behavior. So that um, was a, it was really um, a difficult story yeah. to uh, report um, something that, uh, um, you know, we had to sign uh, an agreement with him uh, that we would disguise his voice and um that you know his identity would remain anonymous and everything but mm -hmm. um it's a story i was really proud of and uh, this american life the radio show that most people have probably heard of uh, yeah. did a segment uh several years ago on um this uh type of person you know a, a pedophile who um who never uh who never sexually abuses any children and, and uh recognizes that that they you know that doing so would be um immoral and, and wrong and uh and they actually referenced this um uh, actually no they didn't reference this program in germany but when after i heard this uh story i was thinking well i uh you know they they should really have taken it the next step and figured out there are other um models in other countries where um you know this type of thing exists so yeah, yeah that i mean that was probably one of the stories that most sticks out in my mind not like the happiest or or right. most, um uh um uh, you know, a, a lovely and happy thing to think about, but um, something that I think uh, is also kind of indicative of um, of the German culture and their um, uh, the the difference in stigma around certain um, things. You know, uh, particularly with sexuality, it's a much more open culture, mm -hmm. and um, you know, a, a culture that um, I think uh, tends to um, not uh how do i put this um there's uh, i just think there's um compassion for um th they can be you know much more compassionate society and a society that um tends to um not immediately write certain people off as um beyond saving or beyond help um but actually you know is looking at ways to um to help people who haven't done anything wrong but um need help in order to, to not do anything wrong if that makes sense yeah no that that's very interesting i mean i think i think mm, outsiders looking in may think the opposite in some respects but i think that that's a very interesting perspective you know i, I have a friend who's moving to germany and there's um you know there's there's a lot of discussion that we're having lately about the culture and things like that but i've not heard that um and i think that that's a that's pretty fascinating i think i think it also goes to show when you're in a community, you know, as a journalist and you're there, you know, the things that you see in your day to day life become the things that you cover. They become things that uh, spark interest in stories, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like it was literally just because I was in this subway and saw this video that was playing that 
you know, lots of other people saw. There were other stories that I, I you know, the thing about being a, an English language journalist in, uh, in uh, Germany is there's, you know, a lot of reporting is done by the local media and the German press. And mm -hmm. that's sort of like the first draft reporting or whatever. But um, uh, there's, you know, still a lot of people in the city um, not even just Americans or, or uh, native English speakers, but people who uh, maybe aren't as fluent in German, but have uh, more access to uh, English and are able to read uh, news in English. And so it, it was, um, uh, you know, there were lots of opportunities to um, report stories that, um, uh, you know, for a, a new audience in the, in uh, that community. Yeah. And, uh, definitely, you know, being a foreigner, you th being from a country and a community, there are probably certain things that you take for granted that, um, you know, maybe you don't realize are interesting to other people. Um, but, uh, you know, when you have an outsider's perspective, you come in with, um, a fresh look at it and think, huh, this, this is different from, from what I'm familiar with. And so I should, um, figure out what the story is here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. So I kind of see this theme, you know, as you talk about your international work and work in Germany, you know, and then you translate that into uh, KPBS, right? I mean, cities seem to be something that you're very passionate about what's happening there. You know, eight years ago, as you mentioned, you joined KPBS. I think that's the, in marriage terms, it's like the bronze year. So I don't know if they're going to give you a bronze microphone when you hit that eighth year. Uh, exactly. But, <laughs> but I mean, I'm wondering, did you, when you got to KPBS, uh, was Metro Reporter your initial kind of beat or did you kind of work your way into that or how did that work? Yeah, I was hired as the Metro Reporter. So um, so that's been my job for uh, all of the time that I've been there. Um, one of the things that was really uh, um, uh, that I'm really grateful for when I first started there was my editor uh, gave me the time and the space uh, to basically get to know as many people as possible in the community. Uh, like I said, I had come here to San Diego, never having even been here before. So Andrew, you were saying that you got to know a bunch of people when you got into town and things like that. Are there, did you get to kind of shape the beat or was the beat already shaped when you got here? Cause you've really kind of carved out a niche here. I feel like, you know, in, in terms of the subjects that you cover, uh, Metro is pretty broad, but I think you really do hone in on the stuff that most San Diegans really care about. Yeah. You know, when I first got here, uh, I, I mean, p the biggest difference between my life in Germany and my life in San Diego was how I got around. I, I never drove a car for the six years that I lived in Germany and here I was driving pretty much every day. So um, so that immediately was something that I was thinking, you know, this is, um, an area that I'm interested in covering. And, um, uh, so, uh, you know, I noticed that there wasn't a whole lot of coverage of public transit. Um, but at the same time in October, 2015, which was a month after I started at KPBS, the city council passed their climate action plan, which hmm. included goals for just huge increases in public transit ridership. So I was thinking, well, you know, if this is um, going to be such a big part of our the, the future of transportation in San Diego, then, um, you know, we need journalists who are willing to dig deep here and, and really um, figure out how, how we can pull this off. So that was something that um, I was definitely drawn to. Um, I did some reporting on the Compass card, which was the fair payment card at the time that MTS used. Yep. Um, that uh, didn't have some pretty basic functions that most other uh, fare payment cards uh, systems in other cities did. Um, and it was, uh, yeah. So, and then, you know, the my reporting on housing and housing policy and everything, I mean, that was, it's definitely something I'm interested in being, you know, a fan of cities and of, uh, you know, uh, um, just enjoying living in, in or urban environments. Um, but it was also, you know, in the, in the first couple of years, very quickly became the, uh, main political issue, uh, in, in the city and in the entire region. Um, so it wasn't really something that I myself identified as this is a big story and I want to cover it. It was something that, you know, 
I, I knew it was a big story, but uh, uh, not just because I cared about it, but because everybody else seemed to care about it as well. So that's kind of been um, how I've uh, gotten so interested in in um, all of that and how I've, I, you, you know, to your question, yes, I, I was actually, I had quite a bit of, um, of leeway in shaping the Metro Beat at KPBS and, um, and that, you know, so it, it was both uh, things that, you know, were objectively big news in San Diego uh, and still are, uh, as well as my own personal interests and, and um, things that I, you know, can get excited about. I mean, the best stories that uh, most journalists will tell you, the best stories that they write are the ones that they actually have, uh, you know, an interest in and can get excited about. Well, and, and that's um, one of the questions that I was wondering, you know, you've started this new uh, podcast launched recently called Freeway Exit. Uh, yeah. And could you talk to us a little bit about that? Because it definitely has to deal with roads and this issues. I, I was listening to the episodes. Talk to our listeners a little bit about that. And we'll make sure we put some information in the in the notes about it. Yes. Uh, Freeway Exit is um, one of our it's one of the first podcasts of this kind, it's a sort of serial narrative story. Um, we're uh, starting with six episodes, the six, uh, the, so, um, we're speaking today, at, uh, on May 30th, uh, episode five just dropped and the sixth and final episode will drop on June 6th. Um, it's a story about the past, present and future of San Diego's freeways. Um, the, how I sort of came drawn, became drawn to the subject, um, when I first got to San Diego, freeways were a big part of the debate at SANDAG, our county's uh, our regional transportation planning agency. Um, so there were a lot of debates over whether certain freeways would should be widened um, and, you know, how we're going to spend our limited transportation dollars, how we can do so effectively in a way that aligns with our climate goals of reducing driving and reducing our dependence on cars. So, um, they were, you know, uh, uh, freeways were uh, definitely a big uh, subject in terms of just the day-to-day -day news that I was covering. Um, uh, but then the longer that I stayed here, the more I started learning um, bits and pieces of the, hist the history around freeways and how, for example, um, when I-5 was built through Barrio Logan, it really devastated that community, um, reduced the population size. It, it made it much, much, much more difficult and dangerous to um, walk for many people just to walk from their home to their church or from their home to their school or their job. Um, and so it, it really had a, um, a, a negative impact on that community, also in terms of air pollution and um and uh, just environmental health. Um, uh, similar stories around uh, SR-15, the freeway that goes through City Heights and how that community um, fought to get more amenities alongside uh, the freeway, uh, which is why there's a, a lid, a park, over one of the blocks of the freeway in that community. Yeah. So um, a lot of this history, um, you know, I think some folks maybe uh, stumble upon it at some at one point or another, but so much of it is is forgotten, and um, and so it seems like a really ripe topic for some deep dive reporting, um, and a lot of these uh, stories around the origins of our freeway network, I think, actually do carry some important lessons for us as we continue to debate the future of transportation in San Diego and. Uh, you know, the um, also as we grapple with the um, harms that a lot of freeways have caused to certain communities and ask ourselves, you know, uh, if, if this harm was um, was unfair or unjust, then um, what uh, obligation do we have to try and repair some of that harm? Um, and and you know what is that going to take what kind of sacrifices are we willing to make as a society in order to do the right thing and to try and help the communities that were uh really just um disrespected and ignored and um and uh, beaten down by these massive public infrastructure projects so um uh it's it's a podcast about um like i said the past present and future we're looking at different ways you know ideas that are being discussed in san diego 
around how to um, mitigate the impacts or the harms of, of freeways and um, you know is there can we see a future where so few people are you know where we've actually met our climate goals where fewer people are driving uh, and when they do drive they're driving much shorter distances and we are less dependent on the freeways and uh, if that if that is the future we're able to imagine then um, what do our freeways look like? Are they always going to be um, the way they look now at that same size and scale? Is there a day where we could actually uh, remove some of our freeways and convert them into uh, regular um, streets or boulevards and, mm -hmm. and maybe repurpose some of that um, public land? Um, you know, there, there are ideas, uh, you know, these, these types of projects have been executed very successfully in other regions. And there's uh, quite a bit of money coming from the federal and the state governments to um, uh, to support these types of projects that um, heal the wounds that freeways have caused on communities. Um, and so uh, it was uh, a really, really great opportunity to um, work on this podcast for uh, the better part of six months. And um, this once the six episodes are out, um, I'm going to keep on working on on the pro on the podcast and filling new episodes from time to time, but um, also be balancing that with my uh, regular reporting job. So um, it's sort of to be determined how, how it'll, the shape that it'll take in the future, but um, I'm really excited. It's been an absolute joy and it's been very well received so far. Yeah, no, I've listened to it. I mean, it's been great. It's, uh, it's interesting because I think many of us, you know, I'm originally from Detroit and, you know, freeways cutting through Black Bottom, uh, which was a predominantly African-American community in Detroit, you know, it was a huge thing and it continues to be today. And I think that, uh, frankly, until I listened to it, I, I wasn't thinking about it, that it happens in other places and the issues. Um, you know, I knew what happened in my community or in my, you know, in my city, I should say. But, um, you know, I think I think it's very fascinating. I mean, even things you get to like certain details, like, you know, the potential of the t I think you call it the tire dust. You know, and what that, Fire dust. yeah, what that could do, you know, for a community. I mean, there's so many different ways you could be, uh, you know, hurt, harmed, or uh, helped by freeways, and you're really laying that out uh, in this series. So I'm looking forward yeah, to I think the next episode. It's, it's, I mean, uh, to your point, like th this, these types of uh, stories happened literally across the entire country. Mm -hmm. um, there, the, with the, Interstate and Defense Highways Act, which was uh, signed by President Eisenhower in 1956, there was just this huge um, uh, uh, avalanche of federal subsidies going towards uh, state transportation departments all across the country to build freeways. And, uh, you know, we get into some of the history of um, how that took place, how Eisenhower never really envisioned uh, the freeway network that we had today and was actually quite disturbed and horrified by the direction that it took in uh, displacing a lot of um, uh, people of color and, and uh, dividing a lot of low income communities. Yeah. So it's a, you know, it's a story that happened all over the country and which is one of the reasons why I hope, you know, this this podcast will find an audience outside of San Diego, because these questions, I think, are uh, around, uh, you know, the impact of our freeways and how we can um, heal some of that damage um, are questions that every community can and should be asking themselves um, because, you know, the, the transportation network that we have today, um, we think of it as uh, free, you know, to use. You don't have to pay a toll to drive on the freeways in San Diego. And right. yet... Uh, it's not free. There are a lot of people who are paying a price for the continued existence of freeways, and uh, many of them don't even drive on the freeways themselves. So, right. um, if we're we're really serious about our climate goals, about you know trying to build a more walkable city, a healthier city, uh, then these these questions I don't think we can just keep on avoiding. Which is some of the uh, you know what I feel like I've observed for several years um, is just our our policymakers. Kind of kicking the can down the road or, or avoiding some uncomfortable conversations um but uh you know i really wanted to bring that into the open and center um this this story and the whole project no thank you for doing that thank you for 
focusing in on such an important subject. I mean, there's a lot of that discussion happening and we look forward to kind of continuing to follow that series as it kind of wraps up. But then as you continue to report on these issues as it relates to our community here, you know, I, community, you know, that I feel like that is a big word that is kind of permeated throughout this entire discussion that you and I have had today. Um, you know, and one of the things I want to talk a little bit about, you know, we got a couple more questions before I get to your breaking news round, but I wanted to talk like on a couple of subjects, maybe a little more personal. Um, you know, when we talk about community, you know, you uh, are a member of the LGBTQIA community here in San Diego. Um, you know, and I remember seeing, you know, especially recently during uh, the MPOX virus, you know, how it was affecting the community. I felt like, you know, you did a really good job of using your platforms, your Twitter presence, your, you know, your station's willingness to give you the room to educate, inform, and, you know, hold folks accountable on things that were happening around that. I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing with our listeners, like, you know, what has it been like being a member of the LGBTQIA plus community in the news business uh, throughout your career? And why does representation in newsrooms really matter? Sure. Well, um, you know, it, it. I should acknowledge. I, I think I come from a background of um, quite a bit of privilege. Um, so I uh, grew up in California. Um, have lived my life in in cities and communities that are. Um, very welcoming to uh, queer people. And so um, I don't feel like I've experienced a great deal of discrimination for being a gay journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean that I have not also seen instances where I or my friends or, or peers have been treated differently um, because of, uh, you know, our, our gender or our sexuality. Um, I've, I've seen and witnessed people, um, you know, uh, queer journalists, uh, have their uh, ability to report on certain stories be questioned by their editors um, because they are from that community and so it you know does that sort of disqualify them from reporting on that community um, and these are conversations that I think journalists and and newsrooms have um, uh, been having more often in, in recent years there was a big reckoning uh, around race and journalism after the George Floyd murder. Yes. Um, and a lot of newsrooms, you know, started um, crafting new diversity, equity and inclusion statements and things like that. And so um, I, I, I do feel privileged in, in being able to use my um, position. And I should say, you know, I'm, I'm speaking on my own behalf, not on behalf of my employer. Of course, yes, um, of course. But uh, I, I do feel um, uh, honored and, and privileged to be able to use that um, platform to try and speak out in favor of and in support of diversity in newsrooms. Uh, I think ultimately, you know, the best uh, newsrooms that do the best job of covering the news are the types of newsrooms that have the same type of diversity, you know, uh, that is reflected um, in the community that they cover. And so um, I also think that there are certain blind spots that a reporter who is straight and cisgender um, may have when they're reporting on issues of, you know, surrounding the, the queer community that, um, uh, you know, that a, a person from that community may not have, you know, may be able to spot certain um, uh, uh, problems with the way that a story is told or um, ways in which our community might be othered in the um, in the news coverage. Mm -hmm. um, so and then, you know, there's also uh, still examples. I mean, I, I was invited to speak at the San Diego Pride rally last year in um, 2022. Yeah. And when I um, made that speech, I. Uh, told the story of a, a trans non-binary journalist who worked for South Dakota Public Broadcasting and uh, was ultimately fired, uh, according to their supervisors, because they were not objective and that they, um, you know, um, 
eroded their own credibility by um, sharing stories on social media about being trans in South Dakota. Wow, that's and, a shame. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not just an issue of good journalism, it's also an issue of um, equal protection under the law and of journalists allowing to be their full selves um, uh, in their jobs uh, not having to hide it or, um, or, you know, otherwise, um, relegate that part of their identity to, um, you know, the corner or, or just something that, you know, people are not supposed to know about. Um, so it's, uh, it's a role that, you know, I, I try and play both in the San Diego community and also at KPBS, um, helping other reporters, um, you know, figure out what the right language is to use or, um, supporting, um, you know, uh, my colleagues um, uh, in, in every way that I can. I'll, I'll also mention that I'm a shop steward with our union at KPBS. And um, so I see that also as a role, of, you know, as, a, as an important role of me trying to advocate on behalf of my colleagues. And um, so, yeah, it's, a, um, it's a, a definitely a, a rewarding experience being able to um, to uh, try and you know uh, move things in, in a, what I see as a, a better direction, and try and um, force our newsroom and other newsrooms to have these conversations around um, how to be a good uh, news organization and not sort of um, uh, ask reporters to check their identity at the door when they're um, coming in, because ultimately that that rule or that value of objectivity, I think, is one that favors um you know it, we i think i know certainly that like there is no quote unquote neutral perspective and what um passes for a neutral perspective in many cases is just the perspective of a straight white man mm -hmm. um and so uh you know that that's um uh, a conversation that i um uh really want to see continuing to happen um in the news industry yeah, no, I, you know, I really appreciate you sharing your perspective on that and uh, the perspective that you're coming from. So thank you for sharing that with our our listeners. Um, you know, uh, kind of keeping on this before we hit the breaking news round here. You know, look, people read your name. They see your face on TV. They, you know, they uh, hear your, your voice on the radio. But would you mind sharing with some folks, like, when you're not doing your reporting, you know, what are the things you like to do? You know, how do you unwind? What are your favorite foods and beverages? What kind of activities do you love that are, they, I guess they could be things that inspire your work, but maybe things that don't, that somebody wouldn't necessarily know if they don't know you as, you know, uh, as much as others? Sure. Um, well, I, um, probably no surprise to anyone that I love riding my bike. <laughs> I, I really enjoy, um, uh, Get, you know, riding around town and um, getting to know different neighborhoods, um, just being able to see it, you know, um, uh, out in the open and, and not through a windshield. Um, I have been really getting into gardening over the last, I don't know, six months or so. Um, okay. I've got some grow bags in this area, um, in our um, alley that uh, gets a decent amount of sunlight. So I've got some kale growing there, uh, some snap peas and some tomatoes. Um, so that's been a fun hobby of mine. Um, that's cool. Uh, and uh, also just like learning about um, gardening in, in a really small and confined environments. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, uh, it's something that a lot, you know, I, I live in a condo and it's not uh, a, um, I mean, there's no actual ground for me to garden in, so right. figuring out ways to sort of um, uh, still um, have that uh, access to fresh food and also just see things grow. You know, even if uh, I start a plant that doesn't um, produce any fruit or any any kind of food for me, it's just interesting to see the process from seed, you know, to, to see it all um, grow. That's something that I never really had um, a whole, uh, much of an opportunity to do when I was younger. So That's um, neat. Yeah. That's neat. Okay, so uh, e-bike or regular bike? Are you still doing person <laughs> pedal power, or are you loving the e-bike, or you do both, or what do you do? I have both, actually. I, I, I bought a Rad Mission bike during the great Rad Mission sale of October 2022. I got it for <laughs> 500 bucks. All right, so, all right. Um, 
Yeah, so I've got a, an e-bike, but also a regular uh, conventional bike. Um, my husband is a ballet dancer, so when we go biking, uh, his his legs are usually pretty exhausted, so I give him the e-bike, and I, I ride my regular bike. That's very considerate of you, very considerate. So, Andrew, this has been great. We're going to hit our breaking news rounds, like, do 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 breaking news. And what these are is uh, questions that I've actually adapted. Uh, thanks to a woman I know, Melissa. She she gave me this idea to uh, use the James Lipton Actor Studio uh, questions. There's about ten questions. They really get underneath the uh, the minds of, of folks. And uh, I'd love to ask you these questions. I think they're kind of fun. They're kind of interesting. Uh, and we've been doing this a few episodes. So I think we're going to keep this going. You'd be the third person that, that does these. So are you ready for some breaking news questions here, Andrew? I'm ready. All right. What is your favorite word? I'm going to go with cerulean. Uh, I really, <laughs> like when I was growing up, I loved that crayon. It was my favorite Crayola crayon. And uh, it took me a while to figure out actually how to, how to say it. But I think it's a really cool word and um, uh, interesting spelling and a beautiful color. Wait, can you say the word again? Cerulean. Cerulean. If you've seen The Devil Wears Prada, you know yes. that uh, you know, Cerulean plays an important role in, in that one scene. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is your least favorite word? Oh, gosh. I, I, um, I, I don't have one uh, at the top of my head, um, so... Uh, I am trying to think. Let's see. A least favorite word. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like, okay, that one's a tough one. I, I can't. I don't. I can't think of anything. Well, journalists like words, so maybe there's not one that you dislike. Right. They all, all have a words place. Are good. Yeah, they they have a place. Yeah. Uh, Actually, okay. I'll say this. Okay. Um, you mentioned like community. Yes. So that that is a, a word that I find. Um, you know, it, it has meaning, but it is so often overused and yeah. people use it in so many different contexts to mean so many different things. Mm -hmm. That's something as a journalist that is my pet peeve that, you know, when we can't um, figure out new words to describe things or when we're using one word as a stand in for another, you know, um, that that's one thing that does get on my ner nerves. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard I got an Andrew's nerves this entire no, interview. No, no, no. no <laughs> I'm just playing around. I'm just playing no. around. No, I understand. No, that you're right. We should we should be smarter human beings and be looking for new and interesting words like cerulean to figure out how to work in. You know? Right. <laughs> okay. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Oh. Uh I'm going to say um, I, I've really enjoyed um, exploring uh, nature in San Diego, um, mm -hmm. hiking the urban canyon trails, uh, swimming in the ocean and seeing the sea life there. Um, that's been something that has I've found a very uh, a, a rich source of creativity and inspiration. Awesome. What turns you off? Um, I guess I'll, um, this might be a, a kind of an easy out, but, uh, ignorance and selfishness, um, that, that's a big turnoff for me. Yeah. Not, not qualities that I enjoy in other people. Understood. What's your favorite curse word, Andrew? Um, the one I use the most is probably fuck. So I'll just go with good old fuck. <laughs> All right, what sound or noise do you love? I really love the sound of um, birds chirping. I, I've, I downloaded an app recently um, that you can just like record, uh, you know, sounds of uh, bird song, and it'll tell you what birds uh, they are that are speaking. So I've been using that. Um, oh, wow. And uh, trying to, you know, listen for the different types of bird species that are um, around in San Diego. I love that you had like a, a, an example of it too that you brought in there, like the app. That's kind of neat. Uh, what sound or noise do you dislike or hate? I really don't like the helicopters that fly over uh, on my neighborhood and many urban neighborhoods in San Diego. Um, I, I've always wondered, like, you know, when and how could I do a story on this because it seems excessive at times. Uh, there was one time when um, the police were flying around my neighborhood and 
making this big announcement over a loudspeaker about it was probably 11 o'clock at night about some uh, suspect who was uh, uh, on the loose and the description that they gave was just impossibly generic and I was thinking okay what good are you doing here is this not just scaring people in their homes hmm. uh, you know at this late hour yeah um, so the noise of the helicopters really does get on my nerves I got you I got you what profession other than your own would you like to attempt uh, you know I I, it's hard for me to imagine doing anything other than uh, journalism. Uh, uh, so this is a tough one for me. Um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll say both of my parents' careers I found very interesting, and I could see myself in an alternate universe um, taking those up. My mom was a therapist, and uh, they're both retired now. Mm -hmm. uh, but she, she worked in therapy, and I think that's something that I could maybe do uh, you know, in another world. And my dad was a vineyard manager. He worked in viticulture. And oh, wow. um, I always thought that was a really interesting and, um, uh, uh, you know, um, fascinating career. So yeah. I'll go with those two. Okay. Okay. Is there a profession that, like, you, you know for sure, like, you wouldn't like to do or you wouldn't be good Politics. at? Politics. Politics. <laughs> <laughs> My husband will tell me sometimes, like, I want you to run for mayor in San Diego. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, <laughs> nobody would vote for me. And also, uh, I like that as a journalist, uh, my only loyalty is to the truth. I think that a lot of politicians um, uh, end up feeling the need in order to get elected to just tell people what they want to hear and avoid uh, the, uh, you know, difficult truths that people don't want to hear that might even make people angry. Um, um, but you know, that's something that I don't think I would be able to resist even if I were running for office and trying to get elected. So I'm just going to go with politics. I gotcha. <laughs> um, and, uh, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Oh, good job. Oh, good I'd job. Like to know that uh, the, <laughs> the time that I spent here on earth, uh, you know, that I did a good job. That's great. Andrew, uh, this has been a wonderful interview. I think we've learned a lot. I've learned some things that I didn't know. I Hopefully our listeners did too. You know, Before we close out here, is there anything else you'd like to share with our Flack Talk listeners? Just to search Freeway Exit wherever you get podcasts. Uh, start listening from episode one. Um, it, it is a really interesting and uh, informative, uh, but also fun and um, visually and uh, or rather audibly uh, stimulating podcast um so folks should listen to it and uh, tell their friends about it give me a five-star rating and review and uh just uh yeah search freeway exit all right andrew thank you we will we'll put that information definitely in the show notes i've listened folks and he said viewer uh you can audibly see it in your mind uh when you listen so andrew thank you for that hey thank you for coming on flag talk we really appreciate having you yeah, thanks, James. If you like Black Talk and want to learn more about your favorite muckrakers and newsbreakers, please hit the subscribe button or visit flacktalk.com. New Black Talk episodes with James Canning air every other Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts.